Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for the latest Bridge Culture Club event. Today, we are discussing Once We Were Here by Christopher Cosmos, and today's event is hosted by Bridge Michigan. If this is your first Bridge Culture Club event, welcome. We're so happy to have you. If this is your seventh, we're elated to have you here. Thanks so much for sticking with us for all of these events. We really enjoy them. Uh, my name is Amber DeLind. I am the Membership and Engagement Director at Bridge Michigan. I'm also joined today on the call by my colleague, Jackie Garrett, who is a Fund Development Associate, Associate at Bridge. And together, we'll be leading today's conversation. Thank you all for being here and for sharing your lunch hour with us. In case you aren't familiar with us, Bridge Michigan is Michigan's nonprofit, nonpartisan news source covering issues that matter to you and to your community. You can subscribe for free at bridgemi.com if you don't already. Also, those who are current Bridge Club members, or in other words, people who have donated to Bridge Michigan any amount over the last year, get a number of benefits, including access to a free electronic copy of each Bridge Culture Club selection. You can become a member today by visiting the link that will drop into the chat today in just a moment. Uh, today, we are so lucky to be joined by author and Michigander Christopher Cosmos. I'll give a full introduction of him momentarily, but I just want to start by saying we are incredibly honored that he was willing to join us for a discussion of his novel. Just a quick overview of what to expect today. Today's discussion schedule goes like this. I'm going to give a short introduction to our special guest. I will then lead a discussion with Christopher about the book for a approximately 40 minutes. Uh, we'll just keep an eye on the time and we'll, we'll make sure that we switch over to your questions for Christopher and plenty of time so that you can get your questions answered. If you do have questions for Christopher today, please type those into the chat. We do ask that you remain muted throughout today's conversation, but you can type those into the chat at any time. Jackie's gathering them and we'll at, make sure that we get to those um, in the, the latter portion of the event. We will conclude by 1 p.m. today to make sure that we're respecting your time. So once again, thank you for being here. As you heard at the beginning of the conversation, we are recording this discussion and we'll be posting that recording on our website, which once again is bridgemi.com. Um, one quick opening question. We often wait to, to get to your chats till the very end of the discussion, but we were just chatting in our little pre-show here about where we were all calling in from. So. If you're interested, we'd love to know where you are, are joining us from today. If you want to join, type right into the chat where you're joining us from today, the city or the region. We're just curious to know where everyone on the call is joining us from. Thank you once again for being here. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guest. Author Christopher Cosmos was raised in the Midwest and attended the University of Michigan as a recipient of the Chick Evans Scholarship. In addition to being a best-selling author, he's also a screenwriter and has had his work featured in the annual blacklist of best Hollywood screenplays of the year. He lives in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is where he's joining us from today. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And I just, I almost jumped the gun or I did jump the gun a couple minutes ago too. And it's its absolutely, um, in regards to being here, it's absolutely my pleasure. And it's so very nice of you guys to, to choose, choose this novel. Um, and to sort of invite me to join you. And so it's 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 always a wonderful thing to be able to sort of uh, talk with readers and discuss the book, but even more so when it's readers sort of here within within my own my own community and all of that. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, we are just we're honored and we I think I can I will speak for myself, but I will also speak for the readers who've written in to me to say as they've been reading this book that a lot of us really enjoyed your book. I think it was it was a really beautiful story. I learned a lot, even though it is a novel, you know, it's based in in true history. And so I we thank you for for writing it and for being here. Uh, before I get us started, I'm just curious, um, you know, when we first communicated about you joining us for this event, you mentioned that you were writing from Greece. So how was your time in Greece? Were you visiting family and how was your trip? visiting family I guess per se but I for the last couple of summers I've kind of like last summer I went for I, don't, I think maybe like three months or so this summer I went for for two months um I write a lot about Greece um my family is is from Greece um and so one of the there's there's definitely certainly um drawbacks of being a writer um it's a very it can be a very solitary thing and you're sort of like a workforce of one and that kind of thing but one of the um very cool benefits of it is I can sort of do it from from anywhere. 
Um, and so, yeah, I've just, I've kind of gotten into a little bit of a, a, a rhythm of, of traveling and, and writing. And I write a lot about Greece. And so at a certain point, I was kind of like, you know, like, why don't I go maybe live there for a while and, and sort of write from, write from Greece also, but also um, very happy to be back in Michigan and back in Grand Rapids too. Very cool. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit about that. Um, a little background on you. I'm curious to know if you tell us a little bit about yourself and your history as a Michigan resident and resident and a little bit of why you chose to write once we were here. Raised in Michigan, lived in Michigan my whole life. Um, for anybody that's familiar with, with the West Side, with sort of the Grand Rapids area here, um, I grew up in Ada. Um, I grew up right across from where Egypt Valley Golf Course is now, but it's it's it wasn't there at the time. They sort of started building building it while while I lived across the street, and that was actually sort of the cutoff between uh, the Ada School or the Forest Hill School District and Ada in Lowell School District. And my house was the exact cutoff, so I ended up going to Lowell High School, and then a little bit later on um, moved closer to Lowell. And so for middle school and high school. Um, lived in Lowell, which is about 15 minutes east of Grand Rapids or so here. Um, so th that sort of takes me through high school. And then after high school, I went to the University of Michigan. Um, so moved to the east side of the state and lived, lived in, in, our, in Ann Arbor for four years. Um, and then um, after I sort of graduated, it was probably... Um, it was probably a little bit of something like out of a movie, but I had, I had sort of taken some screenwriting classes. I had taken some other things too. And I, I, I sort of, at that point, didn't really a hundred percent maybe know what I was going to do or what I wanted to do, but I, I sort of packed everything in my car and knew, knew nobody on the West coast or in California or in LA, but just packed everything in my car and moved, um, to Los Angeles and started working. And I, I got a job at interning at, at a production company and then sort of progressed at that company from there until being, um, an executive at that company. And then um, while I was there, wrote and sold uh, my first screenplay. And that sort of launched me into being a professional writer. And um, in terms of the, in terms of once we were here, I, this is a story that I first, um, I, I essentially first heard the stories that became once we were here um, while I was here in Michigan, um, going to the Greek Orthodox church here over, over off of Fulton. Um, and it was something that I knew I wanted to write um, it was something that I thought was better suited to being a book um, than a screenplay or anything along those lines, um, mostly because it was the thing that I was most passionate about and the thing that I most wanted to exist in the world. And unfortunately, with screenwriting, you can make a living doing it, but people don't often make things. In fact, they very rarely make things. Um, and so they'll buy a bunch of stuff and they just kind of can sit on shelves and gather dust and all the rest of it. And I didn't want that to happen with this. And so kind of in between some of my, my screenwriting gigs that were like paying the bills, so to speak. Um, I started working, I started working on, on the manuscript that eventually became, that eventually became once we were here. Wow, that's really cool. And, and what an amazing story. It really does sound like something out of a movie that, you know, you went out there and, and try, gave it a try and really succeeded. That's so cool. Um, and have you, one thing that I realized as I was reading is that I knew very little about Greece's role in World War II. Have you, are, did you study World War II? Have you always known this story and it was just something that you wanted to get out in the world? But tell us a little more about how it came together as a, as a narrative. Well, I, I wouldn't say I, I study World War II or anything like along those lines um, or World War II specifically. For, for me and a lot of the stories that I tell and this being a good example of it, um, I, I, it comes from more of a Greek cultural angle of stories that I have sort of a personal cultural connection to. Um, and sort of the way that this one started in, in like I had mentioned, I, it's based on stories that I heard growing up and, and going to the Greek church here. It, and to be a little bit more specific with that, um, it, it was sort of one story in particular. Um, and it was, I don't know, I was probably six, seven, eight, nine years old. And one day after church, um, all the parishioners um, who were older, who had lived through these events, had sort of, um, they, they had a, a time during coffee hour where they sat all of us young kids down um, and sort of told us stories um, about Greece during, during this time. And there was one that stuck with me in particular, and it was um, a woman was telling me about how when the Nazis came to, the, to her village and they were so hungry, they had to chew on the sole of a shoe. And I didn't understand. And so I sort of raised my hand and asked, not, you know, kind of understanding why you would do that. And she told me it's because the shoe was made out of leather. And so that was sort of a very 
stark and vivid both story and image that kind of stuck with me. Um, I, I was very young, obviously, when I heard it. And so as you go through elementary school, as you go through middle school, as you go through high school, as you go through college, it's, you know, there's an expectation that at a certain point, you're going to learn about these things, these things that were sort of vitally important and that, and that very much sort of shaped even the way that, that the world is now. Um, and as I progress, 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 and even in college, I ended up, um, I, I wouldn't say I was a World War II scholar, but I ended up having a history minor in college because it was something I was always interested in. And so when you can choose electives at Michigan, I eventually, like I met with my counselor, I think right before my senior year. And he's like, you know, if you take this elective instead of this one, you'll have like a minor in history, just the way things have lined up. And I was just, so I was like, okay, you're like, great, like, like, let's do this. But even progressing that far, um, I never heard this scene. I never heard this mentioned. Um, this sort of vitally important thing. And so I, I got to a certain point in, in the question that I asked myself when I was when I was thinking um, back on that moment is, is why, is why did, you know, why did they sit us down and why were they telling us these stories? And the answer, of course, was they were telling us these stories so that they wouldn't be um, forgotten. And, and so for me and my, my journey as a storyteller, so to speak, um, I got to a certain point where, you know, I, I feel like this was a hole in history. This was something that was under discussed, um, under known, however you want to sort of categorize it, um, and something that needed to be told, needed to be more well known. Um, and I got to a certain point and I said, you know, why not me? It's really neat. And I mean, it really does sort of fit with my own experience. I was sort of embarrassed to, to realize how little I knew about sort of that piece of World War II and sort of the, the, the victory for the Allies that I didn't know about Greece's rule. So I, you know, it got me sort of down a historical rabbit hole looking into this more. So it's, I think that's one of the things that is really neat for me about historical fiction is that it can really open a door for folks, and even if they're not typically, you know, someone who reads a lot of, um, you know, nonfiction, it got me interested in wanting to learn more. It really was a sort of something that opened the door for me. Um, I'm curious about your writing process. So you, this is a, obviously a novel. You're also a screenwriter. So, you know, how are those similar? How are they different? How did this come to, how did your book come together? Um, in the midst of the screenwriting you were doing? Well, the, the biggest difference is it takes a lot longer to write a book. Um, uh, it takes, it's a much shorter process to write a screenplay. Um, I'll, I'll answer this, I guess, in a little bit of a different way because something that doesn't always come up is, is when you become sort of, you say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna become a professional writer. I'm gonna pay my bills by writing. Um, or, or any art really for the, for that matter, any kind of thing in the entertainment field, there's always the, the, the matter of, um, how do you pay those bills? Um, and so for me, it's, I always knew that this is kind of where I wanted to get to. I always knew I wanted to tell the story. I always knew that I wanted to tell it as a book. Um, but the reality is, is also in terms of the way that you get paid is for a book, um, the floor of what you get paid is essentially zero. You can sell no copies, but the ceiling is infinity. Whereas when you write a screenplay, the floor is much higher, but the ceiling is also much lower. And so for me, as I was just making this jump from sort of being an executive at a production company to say, okay, I'm going to throw this in myself into this um, and, and, and become a full-time writer. Um, the, the screenwriting is essentially how I paid the bills. And that's kind of how I, how I looked at it. And when you turn in a screenplay, there's also a lot more cooks in the kitchen, so to speak, a lot more people that are giving notes and that sort of stuff. It can be anywhere from three, five, 10. I've had, you know, projects where you're getting notes from 15 or 20 people. And so it always takes a little while to, to gather everybody's thoughts together. So you can turn something in and it could be a week until you hear back from them. It could be a month. And so during those interims, I would always run back and work on once we were here. And then, you know, I'd get their notes and come back and do that, but then run back on once we were here as this thing um, that, that I was the most passionate about and continually working on. Um, and then ultimately, um, we're, we're sort of in the midst of another screenwriter or of a screenwriting strike at the moment. Um, but we had another um, incident about three and a half or four years ago, I think, that was another labor dispute where um, without sort of it's not worth getting into the details of exactly what it was. But for a period of time, it ended up being like six months to a year. Every screenwriter had to fire their agent in Los Angeles. It was like this. It was this whole thing. And so it wasn't a work stoppage per se, but it was a stoppage, at least for me, of the way that I procured work. Um, and so I, um, I sort of used that as, you know, this is my sign kind of from wherever that it's finally time to really sort of like knuckle it down and finish this. 
um, and, and, and go forward with, with this book. Um, and so that's kind of, that's kind of what I did and, and very similar to, to going to Los Angeles. Um, didn't know anybody in publishing, didn't really sort of have any connection, so to speak. So I had, I had already moved back to Michigan here at that point and just started kind of like blind querying like book agents in New York and found somebody that loved it. And he helped me sort of, uh, kind of navigate the New York publishing scene and sell it to a publishing house. Um, and that, and the, the journey, I guess, is still sort of, is still sort of going from that. And I'm, I'm learning new stuff about it every day. Um, meaning learning new stuff about, about the book world and the publishing world and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and brings me to do, you know, fantastic stuff like this. That's amazing. Very cool. Um, just a follow-up question, because it sounds like it was sort of a long journey for once you were here. You know, when, when did you start it and when did you finish it? that it would be sort of impossible for me um to answer that but i i it, it, i'll give you the romantic answer which is i started writing at that moment in church when i heard that story um which is also sort of i do sort of truly believe that and i sort of um hint towards that at the back of the book a little bit that i think that i started yeah. writing this long before i ever thought of myself as a writer so to speak um and finished uh it's never, it's, it really kind of is never finished, but I, we sold it to the publishing company. Actually, I think it's coming up on four years today. It was in August of, it's very easy for me to remember, it was in August of 2019. And so I, you know, went to New York, went, met with everybody, had lunch, toured the publishing company, all that sort of stuff, got all these awesome plans together for like a book tour and all these other things like that. Um, and then obviously in March of 2020, the entire world shut down. And so it came out during COVID. It was like a very, so like when you start like imagining, I guess, having a book, having a book out there in the world, going on a book tour, doing all this sort of stuff. And then it kind of like comes during a um, once in a generation pandemic. There was a bit of a, there was a bit of a pivot there, so to speak. But that was, that was generally kind of the journey. Very cool. Um, I'm curious a little bit about how you decided on the structure, having sort of the prologue and the epilogue be set in, in modern day, and then the, the chapters set during the war. Did you always know that's the way you were going to structure it, or did it kind of come to you as, as you wrote? That was always the way that I knew that I wanted to, that I knew that I wanted to do it. Um, a, uh, in especially sort of um, relevant for this group is is sort of where I'm from, um, the the way I grew up here, um, and, and sort of this place and the people that are here are very important to me. So it was very important to have a a Michigan connection to it, and I see a lot of Michigan connections uh, or connections between Michigan and Greece also in a lot of different ways. Um, more than just I think what I mentioned towards the end of the book of both of them being sort of like peninsulas surrounded by water, um, but it. it I, I, I love stories that give us that sort of multi-generational aspect in the perspective because um, I, I, this will be a little bit of a tangent, but I was, I was reading recently, I don't know, maybe a year ago, I think it was an article in the New Yorker that was a profile of the author Lois Lowry, um, who's a fantastic novelist, wrote The Giver, a bunch of other wonderful, wonderful things. And one of her quotes in it that stuck with me, because it was one of the things that I sort of believe too, is she said something along the lines of, of you know, literature in telling stories is a dress rehearsal for life. Um, and so for me, one of the very important things, and especially, you know, with this story and why I want to structure it um, the way that I did is um, when you have the distance between time and generations, you can see, um, you know, I, I very much believe one of the themes of this book, and it's even said towards the end of that, is I, I very much believe even though we're all, you know, only here for a short period, a very short period, that what we do um, matters. And when you set things within a multi-general context, you can see how um, what we do matters. You can see how sacrifices pay off. You can see those sort of ripples across time and, and generations. And so that's a very important thing to me as a reader. It was a very important thing to me as an author to include. And also for for even my own family, which I know is is very similar to, to a lot of people's families of, of both what they went through um and, and what they gave up to come here so I could so I could have the life that I have and that that I could do what I do and be able to do things like this and you know and write a story that ends up being based on them that can you know sort of go and reach readers um all over the world absolutely that actually brings me right to my next question I had typed this down but I noticed that um one of our our participants named Jan asked a similar question curious to know I mean 
Once We Are Here is a work of fiction, which I, I'm aware of, but are any of the characters within it inspired by, by real people, whether they be people you know or, or more famous figures? Just curious about that. Um, I won't, I won't give all the way, I guess, the ending away, because I know, I know there's always people that might be in the middle of reading, like all that sort of stuff, but Alexei Acosta's best friend, Kukides, is based on a real character in the sense at, that what sort of happens to him at the end and what he does at the end um, was a real thing. Um, and it was done by somebody uh, that people didn't like, they, they couldn't really figure out who he was. They just know that there was this soldier that did this and it sort of inspired them and that sort of stuff. So for me as a storyteller, that sort of creates a blank canvas that you can fill in his fill in somebody's backstory. So it the backstory uh, of him um, growing up in Smyrna um, and all that it, it is my invention. Um, it's also in a weird way, sort of my my odd or my homage to, to Michigan and Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway wrote a, a series of short stories called In Our Time with one of them is on the quay at Smyrna. And so I gave that to Kukidis as his sort of as his sort of backstory because it's also a very important um, and very tragic event in the history of Greece um, that I wanted to find a way to include. Um, so him and what he did ultimately at the end it is based on a real person. Um, for the other characters, I'll, I, I, I write what I consider to be a, a fairly unique brand of fiction because it, it borders on nonfiction and gets really close to nonfiction. Um, that's why I include the dates and sort of weave these characters through through these very specific and sort of um, specific nonfiction events. So it's almost everything that happens, almost everything that they do it is based on things that were told to me. And then I just sort of make an amalgamation of that and, and, and take a bunch of different things and pieces of information um, and, and, and create characters um, by bringing all that stuff together. If, if that sort of um, if that sort of makes sense and, and answers the question, it's um, but when you grow up, especially growing up as a Greek American, you, you hear stuff all the time. People tell you stuff all the time. Um, and I actually for um, for Oki Day, which is the day that the novel begins, is the day that we celebrate that the Greeks said said no to to Mussolini and the Italians invading. I put together um, a video that I can I can send to you too if, if people want to see it. Also, where I um, I, I actually worked with um, a video production company here in town in Grand Rapids to put it together, um, and we use some music, and it's a mix of both. Um, public domain uh, public domain pictures as well as sort of personal pictures from friends and families and people who who sort of lived through this who are some of the some of the people whose um, kind of story is kind of inspired and informed um, the story of the characters. I would love that. that and I'm sure that some of our many of our readers would as well so we'd love to to include that in our follow-up about the event um, kind of, Speaking of Greece's role in World War II, I know we've touched on this already, but do you have a sense of why you think that this sort of chapter in history isn't better known? Uh, you know, at, I'm asking you to sort of pontificate on it, but I'm just curious if you got a sense in your research about why that, that might be the case. No, but it's, I mean, it gives us the opportunity for, for why we tell stories. I, I, you know, I know there's always, you know, the people with the loudest voice tell, you know, tell the stories for the most part, and and that's not that's not Greece, um, and so that's one of the reasons um, I included the quotes from the four world leaders um, in the book to sort of orient in that sense, and and in the, at, during the time it, it was um, sort of well known, but things can fade and all of that, and so I, I mean there was a Greek Epson, there was a Greek warrior that was um, that to commemorate the the victory over the Italians was the very first big Allied victory in the entire war. There was a Greek Epson on the cover of of Life magazine. Um, so during the time, it was a very followed thing, um, sort of very known thing. And then you know, like I said, as as things begin to fade and people um, you know start searching for different ways to discuss something stuff, it's kind of I think the loudest voices. Um, sort of rise from that. Um, and so, you know, again, while, while I, I sort of um, can't speak for everybody from Greece and all that sort of stuff, I can, um, I can try to uh, speak for some of us and sort of make it more well-known, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, as I was reading, there are so many characters that are very memorable in the book. Um, were there any that were in particular were, that were difficult to write or ones that just came to you right away? I'm curious about your character development. 
so the, this will this will be a this will be an answer that might feel a little bit like sort of dodging or a non-answer, but it's it's I feel like I'm probably one of one in this, and it's and it is actually sort of how I how I feel is it goes a little bit along with what I was saying. I, I write a particular brand of fiction that that sort of borders on or gets fairly close to nonfiction. Um, is is I see this for this for me for the stories that I tell, I I, I see them as as real. I see them as sort of existing out here. Um, and so they're not mine in a certain sense. And I, I see myself more as a, I don't know if maybe transcriber is the best, is the best word. And so my, my sort of the way that I, the, just the way that I see story is, is it's this real thing that's out here. And it's my job to sort of become good enough at my craft to be able to put it down in a way that's provocative or engaging enough um, for people to read, enjoy, discuss, spend money on publishing all of that sort of stuff so so for me it's in that sense any um you know any any fault in it is is sort of my fault of craft alone it's not a fault of the story but it, it's it's i don't see it as kind of like a piece bill thing i see it as this thing that's out there that i have to get here so i i, I see it as already being there and whole and complete if that makes sense sure very interesting i'm i I'm not a writer, but I'd love to be I, one. And I, I, I just love to hear about the way that, you know, your mind works as you put these things together. Probably one of one and kind of like feeling and like thinking about it that way. And I guess it's maybe a little bit more of a like esoteric or romantic way of thinking about it. But um, I don't, it, it's sort of how I, it's sort of how I've always, it's sort of how I've always felt, I guess. Very cool. You know, one of the themes that I that I certainly detected as I was reading it, and it, you know, there's some of the more challenging parts of the story. We're reading about how war can sort of lead to losing touch, or at least feeling less connected to one's humanity. Um, could you talk a little bit about this and whether this was a theme that it was important for you to convey to your readers? Yes, um, very much so. I it's something that ends up being, I think, a hallmark of, of a lot of my work. Um, and I think I even at one point put in this of something along the lines of, of you know, war it's, it's is beyond sort of what we've been made to be able to endure, um, which is is something that I very much believe. And you know, once I write a book and put it out in the world, it's it's for anybody who you know buys it, checks out from a library, reads it. However, it, it becomes sort of you know theirs to think of it as they will. And, you know, I've, I've, I've had people talk to me sort of um, about this as a war novel. T to me, it's, I, I set down more to write um, a love story, um, both a love story between two people and a love story between sort of nation, culture, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, war is a very large, a very large piece of it, but in so much that it is a war novel, um, my hope at the very least is that it's, that it's a war novel um, that's also a call for peace. Um, it's uh, it's unfortunate that this is you know something that seems to only become more and more relevant by by the day, um, as you can have you know people minding their business, living their lives, loving their loves, doing all these things, and then have somebody show up at their door and and try um, to essentially you know kill them and take all of that take all of that away. Um, so I, I don't know. There's there's clearly some sort of piece of human nature that leads us to that. And it's, you know, if you look at the span of human history, it's, it's always been there. Um, but at least for me as a, as a, as a storyteller, as sort of a member of the human race, I guess it's, um, you know, the, the most that we can, we can do is try to fight against it. Um, and so I, I try to fight against it with, with the stories that I tell. Absolutely. You talked a little bit at the beginning about, you know, that this has always been a story that's that's inside of you and that, you know, you, you have this deep connect connection to Greece. Do you intend on, on writing more that might be set in Greece, either as a film or as a novel? Just curious about, like, is, is this a something that you want to continue to explore in your creative journey? The short answer is um, is very much so, and it sort of piggybacks um, a little bit on, on what we were I'm um, talking about at the beginning of of traveling there and being there and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's that's um, that's very much a part of it. Also, um, it's very much a, a place of inspiration for me. It's very much a place of connection. You know, it's like I can I can go to the village where my family's from and and stand in a church and wonder, you know, how many how many members of my family have stood here before? Like, what did they dream? What did they think? What did they pray for? What were their so? And and that's all very um, sort of rich um, material for me to kind of 
kind of work with and stuff that that inspires me. So so yes. Very cool. I think I might know the answer to this question just based on our previous conversation. But in in non strike times, are you still screenwriting? Are you trying? Are you doing both? Do you see yourself specializing in in film versus books, or continue to do both? I think um, for, for me, there'll, there'll always be a version of both. It's it's kind of the sweet spot is I would love to sort of take stories that like like once we were here um, that, that I love and write them as a book. And if I can sort of, you know, be able to translate it to film, television, like whatever it might be um, and kind of, you know, be able to monetize the story from beginning to end and sort of tell it in as many ways as possible. Um, I, I think that's ultimately sort of um, what I'm working towards and kind of what what the sweet spot is for me. But but like I said, it's it's I grew up I'm somebody that grew up reading more than watching television. We didn't really have TV in my house, but I had tons of books. Um, and, you know, I, I, I grew up going to and this will be if anybody's in the Grand Rapids area here, we have one of the one of the one of the great any bookstores in the world um, over here, which is Schuler Books, which is on 28th Street. So I, I grew up going to Schuler Books. Um, it's It's still there. Um, one of the sort of the great honors, great pleasures, great joys of, of this journey for me is to be able to sort of, you know, go there at every year of, of, of my life and as I grew up and then eventually get to the point of having my own my own book on the shelves there. Um, so, yeah, it's it, it kind of kind of in that space. But the the obviously I, I, I sort of feel like I have pivoted to being a, a novelist first um, and a, a lot of what is very um, what I enjoy about it is like I also kind of said at the beginning is when you write a book and it gets published, um, it comes out. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, yeah. That makes sense. I, I don't know what you can and can't tell us because I know when things are in process, sometimes you can't talk about them. But can you tell us uh, anything about what you're working on now? More book stuff. Um, I, I would, I I, I don't have a I don't have the firm sort of I guess thing to tell you sort of here today, but but very much hoping um, for for something new potentially new by next fall somewhere around in there. There's still definitely as there always is kind of like moving pieces and and other you know sort of cooks in the kitchen and all of that sort of stuff. So um, especially right now without without with screenwriting with everything with screenwriting in, in Los Angeles kind of at a standstill, it'll be it'll be some some books and we'll be excited to to sort of get them out there and hopefully be able to maybe uh, discuss with everybody again. Absolutely. We'd love it. Um, I, that's most of the questions that I had pre-written. So I'm going to turn at this point to some of the questions that our readers have submitted. Um, so a reader named Neil asked a bit about sort of the, the piece about the apostle Paul at the, near the beginning of the book. He was wondering just about its significance, how it fit into the story for you and why it was an important piece of the, of the narrative. I, uh, it w so it, again, it, it piggybacks a little bit on um, the, the answer that, that I had about why I sort of opened and closed it in the present, because I, I love things that connect generations together. Um, and that's sort of what, what, that's, what that story does um, a little bit. I also kind of like stories within stories. Um, and also, um, it's, it's sort of a very Greek thing to kind of tell this story that, you um, you know, I've had a, I've had a few people be like, well, she's that's not true, is it? That she's not she's not like asking him to sort of actually believe this. And the answer is that she is. But I, I very much sort of believe that with storytelling, especially with oral history, and this is again a little bit of a, a, a maybe tangential answer. But you know, the most famous Greek story of all time is is the Iliad and Odyssey. Everybody said it was fake for a number of years. They said Troy didn't exist. This never happened. And then all of a sudden, you know, one guy Heinrich Schliemann said, I think it did happen. He went to exactly where. Homer said Troy was supposed to be, started digging and, and found it. Um, and so um, it's a very Greek thing, the sort of oral tradition of, of storytelling in that sense. Um, and so it was important to me to both have something that, that linked not just even close generations, but generations that were further also, and kind of um, include something that featured that. Very neat. Thank you. Um, another reader uh, had a question, a, kind of a recommendation question for you, Christopher. So Pat asked, well, she said, he or she said, uh, my grandson will be in Athens as a college student for the fall semester. Um, and they wondered if you have any suggestions for him. Oh my goodness, I have I have so many suggestions in, in, in regards to Athens, and I I very I mean this sort of very seriously. Is I'll I'll cover a few things um, here, 
Uh, and if there's other suggestions um, that they're looking for, send me a, you can send me an email um, through my website and I'll, I'll try and get back, try and get back to you. Um, in terms of food, um, there's, uh, there's a place called Othanasi, which is off Monastiraki Square. It's always the very first place that I go to eat there. It's like an institution. Taste Atlas just named it, I think, one of the best like souvlaki places like in the world. It's where you can go and get like the typical like big plates of souvlaki and Greek salad and, and mythos and saganaki and all the rest of it. So that would be sort of my my first, you know, um, recommendation. There's also two other souvlaki stands. One is called Costas and the others is called O Costas, not to be confused with each other, that you can sort of Google those two. And those are generally seen as like not sit down restaurants, but the two best places to go. So we'll quickly cover that one because souvlaki is very important. It's sort of the, the Greek street food. Um, so those are my three sort of uh, souvlaki recommendations. Um, college student. So there's also, Athens is very quickly becoming one of the sort of amazing cultural centers of, of the world and of Europe. Um, and they have, so for, so college student, so they have two bars, which are within very close proximity to each other that are actually two of the top 20 bars in the world. Um, one of them is called the clumsies and you can sort of Google and, and, and there's a bunch of YouTube things out about what they do is like, they don't really have real drinks and they essentially have a place above like an alchemy thing where they distill their own different, um, tastes and essences and all that sort of stuff, and then make fairly similar sounding ish drinks from that. Um, but the cool part about it is um, a lot of these tastes and things are very Greek specific. And so they have um, a drink there that they call an Aegean Negroni, which is filled with sort of like Mediterranean flavors um, that I think was, I think two years ago was named um, the best cocktail in the world. Um, and there's a, there's another bar that's close to there too. That's more of a kind of like rum tropical bar called Baba, um, called Baba Rum. They're both two of the 20 best bars, um, in the world. In terms of the cultural stuff, you can do it all almost in a day. Definitely hit the Acropolis, go early in the morning, buy the combined ticket with the museum and the Athenian Agora. The Athenian Agora is amazing. Make sure you go on the hill next to the Agora. So you can see the prison of Socrates. You can see the Temple of the Winds. You can see um, the Hill of Pinnix where the Ecclesia in ancient Athens used to meet. Um, you can walk to um, the stadium where the Olympics, where the 2000 Olympics were. Um, I have tons more, but if, if there's any, so that, that'll cover, that covers sort of a little bit of the, of, of kind of some of the cultural things, some of the food and drink things. Um, and if there's anything further, definitely send me an email. Thank you so much. You, you would, if you were on my computer right now, you would see me Googling uh, flights to Athens. So <laughs> I would love to go. go. Go slightly off season. Um, it's very, very affordable. Um, very, very awesome. I think it set records this year for like the most tourist visited place in 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 the world. It's um, they've made leaps and strides and bounds and um, very, very lovely place. And like I said, very, very up and coming and cool um, cultural center where a lot of young people that aren't even just Greece are going to live, you know, all that sort of stuff. Very cool. Um, a reader named Carol just wrote in and was curious about whether you or, or anyone that you know and love have been affected by the fires in Greece. Thankfully, no, but I was actually on roads three days before the fires happened. Oh. Um, so it was a very, very close call. I was, um, so when you mentioned in my bio earlier about um, having a Chick Evans scholarship, it's a, the Chick Evans scholarship is a, is a very kind of like, unknown sort of thing for being a golf caddy. Um, I, I caddy growing up at Egypt Valley, like I mentioned, I lived across from the golf course. And so a lot of my friends, um, and you live in a house together. So a lot of my friends um, are fellow golf caddies and golfers and that sort of stuff. And so every year I um, enter the raffle to try and win tickets to the British Open golf tournament in July. And I got them this year. And so I went from Greece to the British Open, um, which ended up getting me to England, I think, yeah, two to three days before the roads fires um, before the roads fire started. So it was, I was literally watching the, the news there being like, oh my God, I was standing there like three days ago, like that sort of, like that sort of thing. So thankfully I, I just missed it. Goodness. Um, I, at this point, I think that I have asked most of the questions that I intended to ask, but one thing I was curious about, this is unrelated to, to the book, but you wrote a, an opinion piece for Bridge about the film incentives um, that were in Michigan. I'd just be curious to, to hear your perspective on that and um, just, just, I'll make sure I link it for readers if they want to read it. 
Definitely link it because I'll be able to sort of explain in the article a, a little bit more than than sort of ad hoc and off the cuff here. But I, um, I obviously part of my my experience is working in the film in the film industry also, and I've sort of been um, on the other side of the discussions of um, you know when you get together with the studio, you decide where are we going to where are we going to film something. Um, and we used to have a film incentive here. We don't need more. And and really the only thing that you know that that we need is some version of something it doesn't have to be like massively expansive because then that puts you on a list of of where of where places can potentially um go and films can potentially potentially go because it's not necessarily about how much the incentive is but just if the state has one or not and obviously it's no um secret that it's um that we live in sort of very contentious times um in a political sense and very polarizing times in a political sense and the inciting thing for me, and the reason why I wanted to write the article is because I wanted to sort of orient the issue in this way, is that it's one of the very few bipartisan things that that's out there. And so when you think of like red and blue states, almost every state in this country, except for us, has one, and they span the entire political spectrum. Mm -hmm. So from red states like Texas, Georgia, Ohio, to blue states, California, Minnesota, um, New York, everybody has one. And, and the unique distinction is, is they're free to sort of make one that works best um, for them. And so, so I did, I wrote, I wrote an opinion piece uh, that, that Bridge Michigan was, was so very gracious to, to sort of publish that was sort of um, a call to sort of re-engage with doing the same thing here and, and try and write something um, that, that works best, that works best for us, because we're sort of turning away, you know, Free business by just being one of the very few states that just current blotch says we're not we're not going to participate and you know we do this across the the spectrum and other aspects of of business you know whether it's you know every time amazon says we're gonna you know create a new factory or whatever everybody comes with you know do it here do it here do it here and, and that sort of stuff um and this is sort of something that's no that's no different and, and, and a lot doesn't have to be offered and like i said there's there's models out there that span the entire political spectrum of, of people that have done this and done this successfully that that work for them. Excellent. Thank you. We had a couple of, of questions that came in from readers over the last couple of minutes. Um, Carol was curious about the title of the book, how you came up with it and sort of how it fits into the story. So that's it, it, when I sold it, it was actually titled something else. Um, and once we were here, and, and again, I won't sort of fully, fully get into it because it, it, it comes from the very end of the novel. Um, and, and like I said, I know there's sometimes people that haven't quite finished or are going to read it or, or however, like along those lines. Um, but it comes from a passage towards the end of the novel. And the most important thing and we talked about to me with writing this, and we talked and sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, too, is that... Um, I wanted to get across the idea um, that that what we do while we're here um, matters, and it, it sort of it, it relates to that and it relates to a conversation that that somebody has in, in in regards to that. Very cool, thank you. One last um, Greek recommendation question. Um, uh, Dory was curious about whether you had any recommendations for Greek visitors um, regarding Greek music. Greek music. If not, that's okay. For Greek music, as much of the yeah, I don't know if I do for Greek music. Okay, I'm sorry. That's, that's totally fine. Um, they oh, we got a question. Do you think that your book will ever get optioned for a movie? I I, I hope so. It's something I'm going to be sort of working towards. I I ultimately um would like it to be like a mini series. Um, my pitch for it is to try and do sort of a um, Greek band of brothers meets maybe like Nicholas Sparks, like something along those lines. Um, so I, I, I very much hope so. It's something I very much will be, will be working towards and, and would love to get sort of like a, a limited series or something similar like that, like that out there, hopefully sometime, hopefully sometime soon. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. I think we'd watch it. I see a lot of heads nodding. <laughs> so, um, Anything you want us to know before we wrap things up today or anything that you want readers to, to take away from, from the book or from the conversation? It's um, when you write a novel, it's, it's um, something that I do with a great amount of, of responsibility in a certain sense, because I know it's a, a big ask of people. 
Um, it's an ask both of money and it's an ask of, of time. You know, it's you watch a movie, it's two hours reading a book ends up being a lot longer than that. It's so so mostly for me, I would just want to say thank you. I would say thank you for inviting me here. I would say thank you for, for reading. I would say thank you for supporting this and listening and all that sort of um, stuff. It's it, the entire journey with this for me has been has been in a lot of senses um, very humbling, but also very amazing of being able to connect um, both with readers and especially sort of as I said in the beginning, it's it's the, the the best ones, the best discussions, the best things like this are are with readers in my own community here too because this is, you know, this is the place that 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 made me and the people here made this place and so I see it as sort of a very um, symbiotic and sort of natural um, um, thing and feel very, very lucky and very privileged to be able to do this. Well, thank you. Thank you once again for joining us. I'm going to pass the, the proverbial microphone over to my colleague, Jackie, to take us home. Thank you, Amber. Um, I just want to uh, have some closing remarks here before uh, we end uh, just short of one. Um, thank you again, Christopher, uh, for being here and talking about your book. Um, so openly um, for our readers. Um, thanks, Amber, and the rest of the Bridge team for making this work possible. Um, the Culture Club is always fun to gather, you know, with our readers and our members. Um, so most importantly, thank you to the participants who, you know, showed up today and loved the book and asked such great questions and were so engaged. Um, you'll be able to see the recorded uh, conversation later this week on bridgemi.com slash events. That's where the recording goes um, once we upload it. So keep an eye out if you'd like to pass it around or um, review it again. Um, we'll actually be, you know, uh, in speaking about future Culture Club events, um, our next Culture Club event will be in October. Um, so keep an eye out for the selection. Um, and if you'd like to receive uh, the next selection for October, consider becoming a Bridge member today. That is one of the perks of being a member. Um, every Culture Club selection, you're eligible to receive complimentary as a part of your membership. Um, so again, thank you to all of our listeners, readers. Um, thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Bridge team. And have a great day, everybody. Bye, all. Watch.